Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thanks to Dirk for the wonderful introduction. Uh, we are going to be talking about a recent project or recent projects we have been uh, working on for the last few months, and we are honored and pleased to share with you some of the first results from the polar trial coming out of the CSTAR collaboration. All right, first of all, some housekeeping. Uh, this work is funded by an NIH P50 grant awarded to Dr. Julius Fridrikson and a support grant awarded to Dr. Alexander Basilakos. And a quick outline for our talk. I'm gonna give a brief overview of the aphasia literature as it pertains to this uh, or these particular projects. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the backgrounds and aims of the polar trial and the trial is ongoing. So we are going to present some preliminary results from a couple of projects, and then followed by some discussion on conclusions and future directions. So we can quite confidently say by now that therapy for chronic aphasia is effective. And I'm citing here the Breitenstein et al. paper, which is the first large scale uh, treatment trial to show that intensive aphasia therapy can lead to lasting gains in language, language function in chronic aphasia. However, we also know that there is large variability in response to impairment-based therapy, and that many of the therapy approaches uh, that have been studied are supported at best uh, by moderate grade evidence. Now, there is... Uh, a gap in this literature in terms of identifying predictors of treated aphasia recovery. Uh, most of the studies that have looked at predictors of recovery have been conducted in the acute phase or in spontaneous recovery. And it would be overly presumptuous to assume that the same predictors that predict spontaneous recovery do predict treated recovery as well. However, knowing the factors that predict treated recovery is essentially crucial for prognostication and treatment planning in clinical practice uh, simply for addressing intuitive questions like will my patient benefit from semantic treatment phonological treatment or should i apply some sort of a compensatory approach to uh, a further understanding of what type of therapy benefits a given patient may be and will be a key component in advancing personalized treatment in aphasia. Now, to address these issues, the purpose of the polar trial is to create a predictive model that uses biographical, cognitive, linguistic, and neuroanatomical factors to predict at an individual level the response to semantic and phonologically focused aphasia treatments. Uh, there are two overarching aims within the polar trial. First, to identify biographical and cognitive linguistic factors that predict recovery. And this goes into the default model that we'll talk about in following slides. And then second, to determine if damage or, or lesion data improves the prediction of the default model. Now, the results we'll be sharing today uh, fall under the first aim. Now, if we visualize this aim, as I mentioned, the default model is based on biographical factors such as age, sex, education, health status, etc., as well as cognitive linguistic factors, um, an extensive set of baseline assessments. Uh, and the model uh, aims to uh, address the question of what amount of the variance in outcome is predicted by these uh, or a combination of these variables. Then the second aim would add to that if, well, does lesion information improve prediction beyond that of the default model. The recruitment is still ongoing. We are in the final year of participant recruitment and have uh, recruited eight, 118 participants to date. And here you see the inclusion and exclusion criteria. I want to highlight that we include participants that have had a left hemisphere stroke and are at least 12 months 
post-stroke, and we exclude participants with severely limited verbal output or impaired auditory comprehension to the point where they cannot reliably complete the baseline assessments and for the treatment protocols. This is our study timeline. Uh, the study takes a total of 39 weeks. So at week one, participants come in for baseline testing and are randomized to one of two treatment groups, either to receive phonologically focused treatment followed by semantic treatment or vice versa to receive semantic treatment followed by phonological treatment. And the first treatment period covers uh, weeks two to four, followed by a post-treatment evaluation and a rest period for washout. Then we have a second um, baseline assessment of outcome measures before initiating the second treatment period, where those who got the phonological treatment first get the semantic treatment and vice versa. Then we have an outcome assessment at week 12 and follow-up assessment at one month and six months following completion of the uh, study. Now we give an extensive, well, all participants complete an extensive battery of baseline tests when they enter the study uh, so that we can get an accurate uh, depiction of their deficit profiles. And I want to highlight that in addition to obtaining a detailed case history, all of the tests that we administer uh, are readily available to clinicians operating uh, within within this field. So SLPs working with individuals with aphasia. And that is sort of the whole point of the default model that we are uh, leveraging something that we actually see already in clinical practice. Uh, we are focusing on two outcomes, two primary outcomes in the trial. First, to assess uh, improvement in untrained naming. We use the Philadelphia naming test uh, and we use well, we examine change in items named correctly as proportion of maximal gain. Uh, and we calculate this as the change from pre to post treatment in items named uh, correctly, divided by the maximum potential for change. In this case, 175, which is the maximum uh, number of items on the PNT minus the pre-treatment uh, performance. The second outcome is a discourse outcome where we, where participants complete three discourse tasks, the broken window sequence, uh, peanut butter and jelly procedural description, and retelling of the Cinderella story. And the calculation here is, is much the same. We examine change in words produced per minute, except since there is no ceiling in uh, the production of words per minute, the mean here of 140.9 is derived from words, per, uh, words produced per minute from a sample of normal aged matched controls uh, coming from the aphasia pain database. So for the treatments, uh, I'm not gonna talk about what each treatment uh, detail, uh, entails in detail but we have these two treatment types, semantic and phonological, and under each of those, we have three treatment tasks. And the rationale behind these specific tasks is for one, that these are tasks that are widely used in clinical practice today. And second, that each one of those tasks has been shown to be effective in, in prior studies. So we are using something we know is effective. I want to highlight that the purpose of POLAR is not to demonstrate the efficacy of these approaches, but rather to mimic or leverage what we are actually seeing uh, in clinical management of aphasia. So this brings us to the preliminary results. First, talking about the uh, immediate response to semantic and phonological treatments. So here we are interested in addressing the question, what factors predict response to semantic versus phonological treatment? And as we are examining uh, immediate treatment response, the study timeline for this project uh, runs through the 12 week post-treatment two evaluation. 
and our dependent variables are the outcomes after first treatment and the second treatment. The specific aims here are do phonological and semantic treatments yield comparable improvements in naming within a single participant cohort? So essentially comparing the effects of phonological and semantic treatment at the group level, and then to examine predictors of each treatment uh, type separately. Now for this purpose, we focus on two outcome measures, uh, phonological PMG and semantic PMG. So essentially the improvement after phonological treatment and the improvement after semantic treatment. Now for this project, we analyzed data for 68 participants that had completed all study activities through the six months uh, follow-up when we started to analyze these data. And in the plot here, you see the main result. So you see here the treatment response after both uh, treatment periods, treatment one in the first panel, and then the second treatment in the second panel. In red, we have the treatment group that got the semantic treatment first, and in blue, the group that got phonological treatment first. Now, after the first treatment period, we see that those who got the semantic treatment first improved uh, significantly in naming of untrained items. Whereas after the second treatment period, the group that got the phonological treatment first, and then in this case got the semantic treatment, improved significantly, um, whereas the other group did not. So in other words, what we are seeing here is that both treatment groups improved significantly only after the semantic treatment and not after the phonological treatment. And in both cases, the improvement was about 8% of their potential maximum gain. Now, our primary analysis for comparing the effects of the two treatment types was a linear mixed effects model where we included four factors, uh, treatment order, treatment type, WAP AQ as an adjustment of overall aphasia severity, and an interaction term for treatment order times treatment type. Now, as we would expect from prior research, we see that WAP AQ score is a significant predictor of treatment response, but we also see that the interaction between treatment order and treatment type is highly significant within this model. So within the study design here, the interpretation of this would be that regardless of which treatment is applied first, semantic treatment yielded superior results to the phonological treatment. Now, although the between group analysis showed a superior effect of the semantic treatment, uh, some participants uh, nonetheless showed a clear response to the phonological treatment. So in this plot, I am showing you at the individual level, the response to both treatments. In blue, the response to uh, phonological treatment ordered from the least response to the greatest response, and then overlaid with each individual's response to the semantic treatment. Now, you will see here that some participants obviously respond well to the phonological treatment, even if they do not respond to the semantic treatment. Some participants do not respond to the phonological treatment and even show some decline while they respond well to the semantic treatment. And then, Others fall somewhere in between, either showing no response to either treatment or a positive response to both treatments. Uh, and corresponding to this, we find that the correlation between uh, response to each treatment is insignificant. Uh, and how we view this is that the pre precise treatment being applied does indeed make a difference, does matter. Which brings us to the second aim, uh, identifying predictors of treatment response. Now we took several steps in, in looking at this. The first one was a mass correlational analysis where we correlated um, the outcome measures shown here in the bottom two rows in the uh, correlation matrix with all of the baseline uh, test scores. Uh, were a total of 59 pairwise correlations, and we uh, applied a Bonferroni correction for multiple comparisons 
So the results I'm showing in the table are corrected for multiple comparisons. Now you will see here that the semantic treatment response correlated significantly with uh, a multitude of uh, baseline assessments. And I should note that in all of these, all of these tests shown in the table, a higher scores, a higher score indicates better performance, so milder symptoms. And in this case, the correlation is always positive, indicating that uh, milder symptoms seem to be related to a positive response to the semantic treatment. Now, on the other hand, for the phonological treatment response, we found no significant correlations. Uh, and you will note that all of these factors associated with the semantic treatment response are weakly and negatively and insignificantly associated with the phonological treatment response. As for further steps, we, well, the next thing we did was to construct stepwise regression models. Uh, now, the rationale for doing this is that we wanted to see what combination of factors, when we adjust for biographical factors as well, best predicts response to both treatments. Now, for the semantic treatment response, we found a lot of the same factors identified in the correlational analysis with the WAP spontaneous speech score emerging as by far the strongest predictor, accounting for a whopping 26% of the variability in the treatment response. However, for phonological treatment response, uh, the final model only retained a single factor, that being sex, uh, which may sound rather surprising, but we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in, in upcoming slides accounting for about 7% of the variability in treatment response. Now we also ran a uh, multiple feed tests to examine binary categorical variables and if response um, differed on those. And we found again uh, for sex that there was a difference in that males responded significantly better to the phonological treatment than did women. And we also found a difference for uh, fluency. So this is whether a participant is classified as fluent or non-fluent. And in this case, we found a double dissociation in that uh, non-fluent participants responded significantly better to the phonological treatment, whereas fluent participants uh, responded significantly better to the semantic treatment. Now, given these observations uh, and these results, specifically that fluency status doubly dissociated between treatment responders and the fact that factors such as uh, what spontaneous speech score and overall aphasia severity seem to predict response to semantic treatment, we performed a post hoc analysis looking at treatment response by aphasia type. And corresponding to what I showed in previous slides, we found that individuals with anomia and conduction aphasia responded significantly better to the semantic treatment than the phonological uh, treatment. And in fact, that the improvement in these, uh, these two groups was quite substantial. If you look at, for example, for comparison on individuals with Bocas aphasia, they seem to respond similarly to both treatments, whereas individuals with global and Wernicke's aphasia show little or no response to either treatment. Now the final analysis that we took here was to, uh, well, we wanted to see how much variability may be explained by a select subset of predictors. Uh, so we constructed general linear models uh, with a twofold purpose. First, to see if we could reduce the number of highly intercorrelated, intercorrelated factors, as many of the factors we had previously identified were highly uh, correlated with each other. And second, since we only found a handful of predictors for the phonological treatment response, we wanted to see if the factors identified as predictive for the semantic treatment response could be used reliably to predict the response to phonological treatment as well. Uh, now we found, well, I should note that the selection, well, a cautionary note, I should say, 
the selection of factors for these models is arbitrary, it is subjective, and it is circular in the sense that we already know that these factors are associated with the outcomes. So a further out of sample prediction uh, using this combination of uh, factors is always going to be necessary to validate these findings. Uh, nonetheless, we find that uh, including these predictors, we can reliably, well, explain a large amount of the variability in response to semantic treatment. And then somewhat to our surprise, the model uh, achieved an even uh, better prediction for the phonological treatment response. Uh, and in both cases, the warp spontaneous speech score emerged as the strongest predictor of treatment response. So to summarize what we find in the first study, uh, we are finding that semantic treatment seems to be more effective at the group level than phonological treatment in this specific sample. And this is something that may need to be scrutinized further in uh, future studies. And in terms of personalized predictors of treatment response, we find importantly that some participants respond better to one treatment than the other. And this is a crucial, crucial take home message from the study in that we as a field often assume that treatment may have its uh, effect in largely the same way, but we are finding that this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, and subsequently, we find that predictors of response to each treatment uh, type do differ. Uh, we see that Wolf's spontaneous speech score, score is a strong predictor of treatment response. And we also found that men showed a greater response to the phonological treatment than women. Now, this point uh, may require some clarification. Specifically, uh, well, we looked into this and we found that sex is not confounded by uh, aphasia severity or baseline performance on the uh, naming task. However, when we dug a little bit deeper, we see that within our sample, uh, men tended to be a bit more uh, severely affected on several tests, namely and specifically tests that uh, tests of auditory short-term memory and phonological processing. So these subtle differences in severity may, may be driving some of this effect. So the general conclusion here is that participants with mild aphasia seem to respond well to semantic treatment in our sample, whereas those with more severe aphasia may benefit from the phonological treatment. Now, what do these findings mean? And here I want to reiterate that these are preliminary results uh, and we still have to run these analyses on the full sample before we can draw any firm conclusions. But as the prior literature pertains to this project, uh, most studies have focused on this debate on whether therapy should be geared towards the locus of breakdown or spared processing. So for example, if you have an individual who uh, is impaired in uh, his capability in, in uh, phonological processing, should the therapy be phonological at the locus of breakdown, or should the therapy be geared towards the more intact uh, semantic processing? So in terms of our uh, results, we find that measures of phonological and semantic processing did not specifically predict response to the respective treatment we find a somewhat more simplistic uh, picture in that individuals with mild aphasia respond to semantic treatment and those with severe aphasia respond to phonological treatment. Now, why this is, uh, is something that we still have to try to address, but one working hypothesis uh, may be that perhaps this has to do with the neurobiological substrates of uh, aphasia and, and specific language functions. So it may be that small lesions may spare the more distributed semantic uh, regions of the brain, whereas more focal phonological regions may be less likely 
to be damaged by larger lesions. And this is somewhat supported by a recent study by Pompon et al, where they found the same inverse relationship between aphasia severity and response to phonologically based uh, treatment. Now last but not least, uh, we are finding that aphasia typology may, and this is in capital letters, be a useful tool for guiding treatment planning. Now, this is a debated topic within our field, whether we should use aphasia classes or classification in general. Uh, but we may look at this as a proxy for a factor such as fluency status and aphasia severity. And to that extent, since we are using aphasia typology in clinical practice, this may indeed prove to be at present a useful tool uh, for guiding treatment planning. So if replicated in our final sample, these findings will be fed into the default model and will hopefully probably enhance prognostication in clinical practice. And this brings us to the second study uh, uh, and I am going to give the floor over to my collaborator, Dr. Alexandra Basilakos, for that. Okay, thank you, Sigfus. I'm just going to share my screen now. All right, so I'll be talking about study two, and this is where we look at predictors of long-term outcome. So we're study one that Sigfus just discussed, uh, presented results from the first 12 weeks of treatment, so this area in the blue brackets. This section will discuss the six-month follow-up. I do want to mention that we do have that one month follow up for purposes of time. I'm just going to discuss the six month results. Uh, and also to mention one of the main outcomes of the polar study is the six month time period. Um, so I won't be going over the one month results today, but uh, once we have our final sample, we will of course be able to look at how treatment uh, or how individuals change from right after treatment to one month into that six month time point. So here I'm using the same PNT PMG score, the proportion of, change, uh, proportion of maximal gain change score. Uh, it's the same score that Sigfus just discussed in his study. And I'm also adding another score here. This is the proportion change in discourse words per minute or WPM. I know Sigfus discussed how we calculated the proportional change in discourse at the beginning of the talk, but just to refresh your memory, um, since there really isn't a ceiling in discourse, we have the the kind of pseudo ceiling that we're using is 140.9 words per minute. And that was derived from a sample of 158 individuals from the aphasia bank database who were age matched controls that did the same three discourse prompts. So again, those prompts that we used here were the peanut butter and jelly, the broken window scene and the Cinderella story retelling. I want to also mention that we averaged the words per minute across all three of the prompts because words per minute was highly correlated. Uh, there was a greater than 0.62 correlation between all different combinations of words per minute per prompt. But I do want to point out uh, some of Bree Stark's work has shown that it's possible there might be some slight differences in the, the types of words that are in the types of speech that's produced with different discourse prompts. So obviously that's something that we'll look at at the final uh, stage of the study. So here I included 74 individuals. This is the same sample that Sigfus included with just a few additional added. And again, these are people that completed all study activities through the six month follow-up. Now, given that the analyses here are preliminary, we chose just to focus on five variables that are commonly discussed with regard to aphasia therapy outcomes. Once the final study sample is obtained, we'll use a feature selection algorithm approach to identify from all of the baseline predictors that Sigfus discussed earlier on in the talk, which one of those predictors might be most influential in terms of predicting recovery. But for now, we're including these five variables. So our independent variables include age. I think this is no surprise. Age is frequently cited as a negative predictor of outcome, where those who are younger might demonstrate better gains in therapy, and those who are older might not show um, quite the same extent of recovery. We're including education. Now, I do want to mention that the results suggesting whether or not education is important for recovery have been mixed, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail at the end of this talk, but we did include education level. We included apraxia of speech severity. Um, this is based on the fact that it has been shown to negatively influence therapeutic gains. This was shown in a study by Julius Fridrickson in 2012, where he looked at um, speech and treatment therapy, and those that had apraxia of speech were less likely to make gains compared to those that didn't have apraxia. 
We're also including aphasia severity. I think this is also unsurprising. So along with age, it's frequently cited as one of the most important outcome, uh, predictors of outcome, where generally those that are more severe are the ones that might make less, less fewer gains in recovery. And finally, our fifth measure is the waste matrix reasoning score. This serves as our measure of non-linguistic cognitive function. We included it because there's a lot of research suggesting that cognition is important for treated recovery, and so we included that here. The table on the right shows descriptive information for each of the five predictors in the study sample. I won't go over it in too much detail. You'll see at the bottom, the last two rows, uh, baseline PNT and baseline words per minute are obviously the baseline um, values for those tests. Those are our outcome measures. I also want to point out on this figure, this row here is the wall of aphasia quotient. Um, and just want to point out that we really do include a wide range of aphasia severities within the study. So it's not just that we're including those who are more mild or moderate, even though we do have that exclusion criteria of those with very severe aphasia unable to participate, um, we do, according to the WAB, have a large number who are falling into the very severe and severe ranges. So looking at changes on uh, trained and untrained items and words per minute, there was a significant change in naming for both trained and untrained items for naming and also discourse words per minute. For the PNT, this is our untrained measure. There was a 5.6 uh, words named increase. So individuals on average named an additional 5.6 items at the six month follow-up. This was a small effect size. For the trained naming test, there was an average of a three item increase, and this was a medium effect size. And I wanna mention here that our trained naming test was 40 items and it included um, nouns and verbs since our treatment stimuli did include both nouns and verbs. And finally, words per minute, we had an average 6.4 word increase from baseline to six months. And again, this was a small effect size. So here I'm uh, plotting these results, and this is the, the raw change. I know we've talked a lot about the proportion of maximum gain and kind of proportional change scores, and we can talk about that at the end. Um, but these are baseline and six month follow-up scores for the left figure shows PNT, and the right figure shows words per minute. The kind of pinkish red color is baseline, and the blue color is the six month follow-up. And the stars indicate that these are both significant increases. Again, I want to point out you can see a lot of variability and change. And I also want to point out that in the words per minute in the discourse, there were several individuals who were outliers. Those are those points in the figure. Um, for the regression analyses, we did not remove outliers. We chose to remove those that were not outliers, or not necessarily outliers, but we removed individuals with high leverage points. And these were individuals who, in the analysis, had a Cook's distance of 0.5 or greater. This meant that we actually only removed one individual from the words per minute analysis. This is a correlation matrix that shows the relationship between each of our five independent variables and our two main outcome measures. I want to take a moment to orient you to this figure. So the um, circle size indicates the magnitude of the relationship. So you can see here WAB AQ and AOS severity have a strong correlation. The color indicates the direction. So the purple color is a negative relationship and the red color is positive. The X indicates that there's not a correlation between those two variables. So for example, we see test age and education has a pretty small circle. The color is also white indicating the correlation is close to zero and the X means that it's not significant. So when looking at PNT change, and this is our PNT proportion of maximum gain score, we see two significant correlations. The first is a positive relationship between WAB AQ and PNT change. So there was, uh, for those that had a higher AQ had greater PNT change. In converse, there was a negative relationship with test age. So where uh, test age increases or as individuals um, age increased, we saw a lower PNT change. For words per minute, we only had one significant correlation. You can see that here in the red, uh, I'm sorry, purple circle. Um, this is with apraxia speech severity and words per minute change. So here we use the apraxia speech rating scale, the a ASRS. A higher ASRS score is associated with more severe apraxia. So more severe apraxia and uh, fewer gains um, in words per minute is the relationship there. Now looking at our predictors for which one of our five 
variables predicted P and T change. This is a multiple linear regression using the enter method. And again, to remind you of our five predictors, our independent variables, these were age, AQ, education, apraxy of speech severity, and the waste matrix reasoning subtest. Our model was significant and it accounted for 15% of the variance in PNT proportion of maximum gain score. Similar to the correlations that I just showed on the pre previous slide, age and aphasia severity were the two significant predictors where there was a, a negative relationship between age and outcome and a positive relationship between AQ and outcome. The regression was followed with a leave one out cross validation approach to evaluate model fit. And the correlation between actual and predicted scores was a 0.29. So when interpreting this correlation, this indicates a good model fit. The figure on the right, our x-axis is the actual change on the PNT, so the participant's actual change score, and then the model's predicted change. So you can see the correlation there. In terms of words per minute for discourse, this model was actually not significant. The p-value uh, p was 0.09 for this model. So while I want to mention null results maybe due to the fact that there's a lot of variability in discourse, and I'm going to discuss this in a little bit more detail later, and I also want to emphasize that this doesn't necessarily mean that we can't predict discourse improvement. We saw a few slides back that individuals on average um, did improve in terms of discourse, but it might be that there are other factors that are more predictive than the five that we entered here. And certainly there are other discourse measures that we can explore. All of the discourse data was coded in chat clan by um, some wonderful graduate students. And uh, if you're familiar with the chat clan program, there are a lot of different variables that we can extract from our discourse samples that we will evaluate at the end of the study. So to summarize these results, based on prior literature, age and severity emerged as significant predictors of change at six months. I want to mention that age and severity were not correlated. So it wasn't just that the older individuals were those that had more severe aphasia and were the ones that were driving this relationship. This analysis shows that they are unique predictors. This could be explained by age-related changes in plasticity. We know that plasticity may be less robust in aging, and it may also be explained by brain health. So as individuals age, there may be some changes in brain health, and we have shown this with a, a study that we did published in the Rehab and Repair Journal um, 2019, where those that had uh, more severe leukoreosis or white matter hyperintensities that are more common as individuals age, the severity of that was also often associated with uh, less recovery and actually declines in, in aphasia severity. So I do want to mention older individuals don't necessarily have worse brain health. Um, there are, of course, other factors, for example, diet and lifestyle. Uh, obesity, smoking, um, and diabetes can affect brain health. But this is something that we will explore in AIM2 when we can look at our neuroimaging data. We also see that more severe aphasia uh, was influential in outcome. So individuals that do have more severe aphasia may have larger lesions or more damage to the critical language areas. So it's possible that there's less spared cortical tissue, tissue in the left hemisphere perilesional, perilesional areas um, that are really critical to support recovery. And again, that's something that we'll be able to look at once we uh, get to AIM2 when we analyze all of our neuroimaging data. Fortunately, we didn't have time to talk about all of that data today, but we really do collect a wealth of neuroimaging variables that we'll be able to, um, to present later once the study is complete. Now we saw that the other three variables, education, apraxia speech severity, and the waste matrix reasoning scores were not significant predictors of PNT change. For that matter, they were also not significant for words per minute, but aren't they important? So I think this is uh, remain to be seen once we have the final sample. In terms of education, it, results, as I mentioned before, have been mixed. It has been shown by Carol and colleagues that education might be correlated with other things. For example, education or those that have higher education might be in higher SES brackets and have different access to healthcare. So other factors might be driving that relationship between education and an outcome. So we'll be able to look at that once we have our final study sample. Um, apraxia speech severity, um, it's possible that those with apraxia, um, either because of the location of their brain damage or the, the difficulty with speech production might kind of preclude some of the, um, the gains they might make in therapy. And again, we'll explore that in the future. And in terms of waste, um, 
and the, the nonverbal reasoning um, as a nonverbal reasoning measure, it might be that there's another measure that we can use from our baseline predictors um, that's more representative of, um, of cognition. Um, so we'll be able to look at that as well, because there are a lot of studies, as I mentioned before, that have shown the relationship between cognition and recovery. And last, of course, our mo uh, model predicting words per minute was not significant. But I think there's a lot that we might be able to discover once we have our final, final sample uh, with other predictors or perhaps other discourse measures. So to continue, again, there's only 15% of the variance in PNT that was explained. And these are our actual versus predicted change for both PNT and words per minute. Again, I've mentioned variability a lot, and Sigfus mentioned this as well. There was a lot of variability in outcome. And I think you can see that here. This is illustrated by um, naming change. And this is the proportion maximum gain change on the left and discourse on the right. Um, each bar represents a participant. And you can see that there are participants who decline over that six month time period and those that improve. Um, it could be that you know, there's one, a lot of variability. There might be other baseline measures that are more predictive. As I mentioned before, once we have our final sample, we'll do some feature selection approaches to be able to figure out which one of the baseline variables is the most predictive. And then lastly, I wanna talk about what happens in six months. So our individuals uh, finish their six, our participants finish their six weeks of treatment, and then we don't see them again in most cases for six months. And there's a lot that can happen in six months. Um, individuals are not allowed to seek outside therapy until the six month follow up. So it's not like these people are continuing to improve because they are getting outside therapy. Um, it's possible that individuals finish therapy and they feel a little bit more confident and are more likely to engage with um, their community. Um, and that might be practicing language skills in ways that they weren't before therapy. And on the other side of that, it might be that some of our individuals um, faced health or personal challenges um, that caused some declines over time. And so these are things that um, we can't really account for over that six month follow up. However, I think this really does emphasize the need for more individualized treatment. Um, so, you know, we're not just trying to predict how people recover immediately after therapy, but, but six months beyond, I think that's the most important are really understanding what are the lasting effects of our treatments. Okay, so some conclusions and directions. So as you saw from both SIGFUS and my studies, preliminary results suggest that we can predi begin predicting treated recovery and aphasia, both immediately, post-treatment, and at follow-up. And again, other factors may have emerged with our final sample, yielding more informative predictions based on other factors like aphasia type and severity that SIGFUS touched on, cognition, and even health status. Um, we do collect a lot of information about health um, in, in addition to our cognitive linguistic measures. So we'll have a lot of um, that sort of information to look at as well. I think these results are also further supportive long-term recovery and aphasia. I want to point out a study by Lisa Johnson, who is a PhD candidate in our lab, um, published in AJSLP last year in 2019, where she showed that individuals, even years post-stroke, are able to make significant gains in, in aphasia, so significant improvements in their aphasia severity. And one of the factors that was predictive of this was continued treatment. And these were individuals who had participated in many of our research studies in the aphasia lab over the last decade. Um, and so that doesn't even account for other therapy they may have gotten elsewhere, but but she did show that long-term therapy is really important, especially in the chronic stage. Um, Audrey Holland published in Aphasiology a couple of years ago, um, a similar study where she did show that individuals do, some individuals continue to show significant improvements over time as well. That study didn't look at treatment since it was a sample from the Aphasia Bank database, but I think it's all good information to show that individuals um, can improve even in the chronic phases of recovery. And where I hope all of this research goes is that outcomes data from large samples of people with aphasia can really support lobbying efforts for greater insurance coverage for SLP services in the chronic stage. So for practicing SLPs that are listening or for perhaps individuals with aphasia or caring for somebody that has aphasia, one of the things that we know is that individuals don't get enough treatment. Um, so you might see somebody for a couple of weeks and then um, that's all that their insurance will allow. We know that there are 2 million people living with aphasia and we know that the stroke age is decreasing. So this might mean that over the coming years, we'll see more people living with chronic aphasia. Um, and for many of these people, continued therapy could be really important for them to be able to um, engage and, and get back into their the communities, their lives and have jobs and things like that. 
And our future directions, as Sigfus mentioned, our study is ongoing, but we've actually just enrolled our last participant to complete treatment um, this past Tuesday. Um, we have been able to continue enrolling virtually, even though, of course, um, the face-to-face -face interaction is prohibited because of COVID, but we're still able to collect data virtually. We will complete enrollment for our control participants. We didn't talk about this group too much for purposes of time, but this is that group of individuals who have had a left hemisphere stroke but do not have aphasia. They will serve as controls for both neuroimaging and the baseline measures. Of course, we have a whole other aim to explore, the neuroimaging predictors of recovery. And then ultimately, what I think is the, the greatest part about this project is that we'll be able to create a web-based platform for SLPs to assist with treatment planning. So what we envision here is that SLP would go to a website and they would enter test scores from their participant or from their patient. And that, that site, that module will be able to predict that patient's response to semantic and the phonological approaches to help that SLP select which approach might be best. And this really goes to um, this ability to, or this um, goal of creating more personalized medicine, more personalized treatment for people with aphasia. Also, as SLPs, I think we do need more uh, research-backed approaches for treatment selection. So with that, I want to thank um, everybody that has contributed to this study, all of the um, investigators, co-investigators, um, our grant funding, of course, and um, I couldn't, we couldn't have done this study without, of course, our participants and their dedicated families, as well as our team of wonderful SLPs who did all of the assessment and treatment. And finally, a huge thank you to our U of SC master's students for all of the transcription and coding. Um, so for everybody um, here and more, um, this work is possible because of you all. And um, thank you. Thank you, Alex and Sigfus. I'm sharing my camera as well. Thanks for your work. That was a really nice presentation. Um, I enjoyed that and I, I know our audience did too because we have the questions coming in already. Oh, great. Um, so uh, first question is coming from uh, William Matchin. Thanks for the interesting results. Given that some people with aphasia actually seem to produce more words per minute relative to healthy controls, for example, people with paragrammatism, how does that affect your outcome measure or is this taken into account? Um, and you know your outcome measure had a, uh, um, an, uh, an arbitrary cap on the number of um, words. So for example, a patient might actually improve by reducing words per minute rather than increasing. Right, so if there is somebody who speaks m more than the 140 words per minute, I think that would mean that they could potentially we would see less of a change. However, we are looking at change relative to their baseline. So I think that could account for that potentially. Um, of course, we didn't look at people based on agrammatism, paragrammatism, um, or anything like that at this point. But um, I, think, I think that also goes to the bigger question of the best way to calculate change. Um, so is it one of these types of proportional change scores, or should we just do the raw change where we subtract um, post minus pre-change or something like that. Um, that kind of gets away from the fact that there could be some individuals who um, have a higher words per minute rate than that kind of pseudo ceiling that we used. Is it, is it fair to assume then that it didn't actually happen in your sample, that you did not have patients who had more words per minute than? Right. Um, I think there may have been one, and I think that's the one that ended up um, getting filtered out of analysis because of the high leverage value. Um, but the average um, baseline words per minute, I think, was 77, and I can pull that slide up offhand. Um, I believe it was it was that. So, yes, the baseline oh baseline words per minute was 42, and our max was actually 127. So we did not have anybody that was um, higher than that. Yeah. Then uh, next question by William Graves. Fascinating, cool studies. Were any of the PNT stimuli also included in the treatment materials? even if it's just the name of the item that might appear in both PNT and treatments. If so, might this have happened more in the semantic treatments? Um, no, so the PNT was our untrained naming test, um, meaning that we did not train participants on any of the items that were in the PNT um, during treatment. So we had that separate, and I didn't go into detail about the trained naming test. It was called our, our naming 40. It was 40 items that were trained in therapy that we 
um, tested individuals on at each at each time point. So um, I think that answers the question. Yes. I think so. Yeah. I also had a question, so I'll, I'll read that out because I typed it in. <laughs> uh, since the phonological treatment seemed to be effective primarily in the second round, so this was in Cyclus's presentation, uh, so after semantic therapy, do you think the semantic therapy is laying a foundation on which phonological therapy can build? Um, so would you mind backing up to that slide, Alex? Sure. Uh, let me see. Which one do you want me to get to? I guess just tell me to click. I think this, this is, fine. is this one? Yeah, this one is fine. So um, your point, Dirk, was that individuals did better after phonological treatment if that was the second treatment, right? Yeah, right. Uh, well, I don't think that the semantic treatment was was sort of preparing individuals for success with the phonological treatment. And, and in fact, I mean, the, the difference uh, after the phonological treatment, uh, whether it was after the first treatment or the second treatment, is really sort of minimal. It's hard to say that the phonological treatment response was better after the second treatment. Uh, and in fact, it seems to be even a little bit worse. So both cases, the improvement was about the same for the uh, semantic treatment. And in both cases, it was very similar or not significantly different. So the response to phonological treatment was not significantly different by whether the phonological treatment was first or second. I, so I, I misinterpreted I, that. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, we have a follow-up to the words per minute question by Robert Kavanaugh. The, to follow up on the words per minute question, when you looked at uh, PMG words per minute, how did you account for people with aphasia for whom a decrease in words per minute is a positive change? Right. Interesting question. So we didn't for this analysis, and I think that's something that we'll be able to do once we have that full sample and, um, and consider whether, for some people, I think this kind of goes back to William Matchin's question as well, is a decrease because you are, uh, hyperfluent or something like that, kind of more more normal, quote unquote. Um, so that's something that we can definitely look at, but we did not do that for this analysis. But that's a great question. Can I chime in a little bit, Turk? Yeah, go ahead. I agree. So I want to say also in terms of the PMT, uh, we have had quite a few discussions about this, but we also know that some participants may improve their language function, but that is not uh, we do, we are not detecting that improvement on the actual uh, correct named items on the PMT after treatment. But I want to point out that Grant Walker and and Greg Hickok have been doing some excellent work in uh, examining other ways of looking at the improvement in in naming uh, using different methods to see how the um, uh, improvement may look, even if it's not reflected in, in the actual uh, improvement score, the raw score or the PMG score, uh, how far individuals are, are getting along of obtaining the semantic information or phonological information and that sort of, that sort of improvements. So that should be coming out sometime soon, I hope. And unfortunately that was going to be an ASHA talk that the th uh Grant Sickers and I were going to do, but because of the cancellation of ASHA, we cannot present that. So, I, I hear another C star talk coming up. Perhaps. <laughs> I was going to say, just in response to, to what uh, Sickers was saying, this is a, obviously something that we that is that we I know we've talked about as well. In some cases, you probably get um, if there is a general type of improvement um, in response to therapy that may uh, come along with greater confidence on the part of the aphasic speaker, right? Mm -hmm. And that might actually result in them trying more and, and being less afraid to make errors, which inc increases their error rates then. Um, but actually it's a sign of a, it's a, it's a positive sign. So I think those are just really challenging things to deal with in this yeah. kind of research like this. Absolutely. 
We have another uh, follow-up from William Graves. Uh, since those with less severe aphasia were the ones who responded well to semantic treatment, could it just be that some amount of intact phonology is a gateway to semantics? Mm. I mean, that's, that's absolutely a possibility. We really, like I mentioned, we haven't really uh, been able or, or we haven't analyzed yet or tried to understand why this seems to be the trend. Uh, and there can be, I guess, multiple explanations. One of those would be the one I talked about earlier that if uh, larger lesions uh, are likely to spare the more focal phonological areas, uh, that might be something that individuals who improve from phonological treatment are sort of working off of and then treatment is, is uh, working at their spared processing level. But there certainly may be other alternative explanations for this that, that we hope to be able to elucidate somewhat when we take a look at the neuroimaging data to see what that would tell us. Hopefully more of a, uh, that would give us more of a, a robust theoretical setting for these findings. Would that be a plug for your dissertation, uh, Sigfus? Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps, we'll see. We, we have a, a question from Jeff Johnson. Uh, I think I missed this at the beginning of the talk. Can you just quickly describe the treatments that were used? Yeah, so I'll just go back to this slide. Um, and we didn't spend a ton of time talking about the treatments since the purpose wasn't to investigate the treatments per se, um, but they're ones that are used commonly in practice. Um, so we, in the semantically focused treatments, we had semantic feature analysis. So that's where um, an SLP would take a card that depicted an item um, and individuals would have to come up with um, information, like categorical information. So for example, what category is it? Um, an attribute, how is it used? Where is it found? Um, so we'd have to come up with all this different information about the semantic features for that item. Um, and then at the end, they would name that item. With VNEST, verb network strengthening, there's a verb, um, there's a, a object, and then a, an actor. So they create sentences with these words in different combinations. Um, and then the barrier task is a pace-like task. So they would have a card, there'd be a word, the SLP would use whatever method to describe that word or um, either object or verb, um, participant would guess, and then vice versa. So the participant would um, see a card. It could be, say the card is apple, and they could either name it, they could describe it, they could um, gesture it. Um, and then there's a barrier, obviously, so you can't, the SLP can't see the word and the, the participant can't see the word. For phonological components analysis, this is kind of similar to SFA. There's an, an item, um, and the participant would have to pick apart some of the uh, phonological features. So. Um, if it's apple, it starts with ah, it's got two syllables, um, things like that. Um, for phonological production task, um, they would have two words and they would take, uh, do phonological segmentation of the words and create new words out of the different um, phonological features of each word. And then the phonological judgment task um, was kind of similar to that one. Um, it was done via MATLAB. Um, so it was a, a kind of a presentation. It's the only one that was computerized. Everything else was kind of traditional um, speech therapy. And similar to that, um, there were different levels that the participant would walk through with um, phonological comparisons between words, um, syllable segmentation, um, and, and things like that. So. Um, Yes, so looking at your next question, everybody got all six. Um, so within each treatment session, each treatment session was about 45 minutes and they had them um, once, once a day for three weeks was the semantic treatment and then once a day for three weeks was phonological treatment. So they had 30 total treatments, 15 of each, um, and each treatment was done every session. So for example, one treatment session might be um, 15 minutes semantic, uh, or semantic feature analysis, 15 minutes VNAST, 15 minutes barrier task. Um, and that was day-to-day, uh, -day. yeah. And I know we couldn't really go into that much detail um, with everything, but um, if anyone else has questions about the treatment, we can take those. Thank you. We have a question from Guan Tao. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Regarding aphasia severity, I was wondering if it's possible that the rating 
is mainly based on spoken language functions and less on semantic knowledge or processing and whether that will be relevant. That's a really great question. Yes. So the WAB, if um, people are not familiar with the Western aphasia battery, the aphasia quotient is the severity score and it's based on performance of all of the WAB subtests. So the WAB has a fluency section, a comprehension section, a repetition section, and a naming section. And uh, with to calculate the AQ, it's our summary score, it's out of uh, 100, where 100 is no aphasia, um, perfect score, zero is profound aphasia, lowest score. Um, but calculating the AQ, the fluency subtests of the WAB account for 20 out of those 100 points where everything else um, ends up being the way the wob is calculated, um, it's, let's see, I'm trying to do math in my head. I think it's about 20% of the score and then everything else is kind of equally divided. And I'm, I might be doing math in my head incorrectly, but all that to say the fluency subtests of the wob do um, weigh more heavily than the other scores in the wob. So, um, so those that are more, more non-fluent tend to have lower scores um, so I think to an extent, possibly the AQ is, it, it definitely is driven by fluency. Um, so it might be, um, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm reading every question to make sure that I'm answering it correctly. Um, but it, it does include semantic knowledge and um, on that too with comprehension. So um, I think that just kind of goes into how the WAB is calculated, but certainly we could look at some of the WAB subtests to tease that apart, um, the extent that fluency is driving the relationship or maybe other um, strengths and weaknesses. I may, may add a couple of points, just because we found that in terms of the immediate treatment response, uh, that double dissociation in terms of fluency status, uh, there was a significant difference in aphasia severity uh, by fluency as well. So that relates uh, quite heavily to the results uh, from the first study in that individuals uh, with fluent aphasia had less severe, of a, uh, had a higher WAP AQ score, less severe symptoms than those with non-fluent aphasia. Uh, and the other point is that I know uh, we can get some sort of phonological uh, semantic measures from the WAP, although it's not specifically designed to sort of create a deficit profile that says that a given individual primarily has uh, deficits in phonological processing or primarily has deficits in semantic processing. And that sort of uh, breakdown of um, a deficit at a specific processing level uh, which is something that prior studies that have looked at like compared semantic versus phonological treatment have often used is to say that if an individual has this phonological processing deficit, uh, what treatment should be, should be applied. But that is certainly something that we, we have other data to touch on. So we may use something like the uh, PALPA test, which assesses phonological processing and the uh, pyramids and palm trees and kissing and dancing tests for semantic processing. So we do, uh, do try to look at those uh, as well in the prediction models. So to some extent, we try to get at uh, what I think this is alluding to. Yep. Uh, we have a question from Hannah Kim. Great presentation. Can you remind me what discourse measures were used other than words per minute? If you consider looking at different aspects of discourse production in language samples, what measures do you have in your mind? It's not a question though, how about looking at lexical diversity in discourse language samples? There's an index of lexical diversity included in the CLAN program. Yes, that's a great question. We've talked about this a lot. Um, we talked about, or we included words per minute here because that's one of the main outcomes um, that we included initially in this project. Um, we also plan to look at verbs per utterance as well as errors produced in discourse. Um, but we've had extensive discussions about the best measure to use. So certainly words per minute is not going to be the only one that we explore. Um, we will continue to look at additional measures. I know there's a lot that you can get from, from clan, um, clan output. So we will explore additional measure, measures, not just words per minute. Yeah, and we have a follow-up from Yuan Tao. Um, thanks. So those domain-specific predictors, 
uh, don't predict treatment gain then I gather. No, uh, um, that was one of the points I, I tried to make that we did not see that neither did uh, those measures of phonological processing predict response to phonological treatment nor to semantic treatment and vice versa, those measures of semantic processing did not seem to be related to neither the, the response to phonological nor semantic treatment. So that was one of the things, one of the hypotheses that we uh, specifically built when we started to analyze the data in this way. But uh, in this sample, that did not seem to be the case. Thank you. I see no more questions appearing. So that means I think um, I'm gonna let you off the hook and we're done for today. Thank you very much for an Thank excellent you. conversation, Siklus and Alex. On behalf of the whole audience, <laughs> Um, thanks a lot, and I hope to see everyone again in four weeks' time when we'll be listening to Ev Fedorenko. Um, uh, keep looking at our, uh, our, uh, our website for our upcoming schedule, and I hope you all also know that you can always watch past lectures on our website as well. So this lecture, like others, will be posted on YouTube as well as on our website. So until the next time, I wish you all well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.